He was called the African Mahler, and he achieved great success early in life. But he died far too young, and many of his accomplishments have been glossed over by history. I'm the Classical Nerd, and today we're talking about Samuel Coleridge Taylor. Samuel Coleridge Taylor was born in 1875 in one of the worst slums that London had to offer to an English mother and a father of mixed race from Sierra Leone. The couple was not married, and Taylor returned to his native Africa, never knowing that he had a son, for he was a medical doctor by trade and was forced out of practicing in Britain because Britain was so racist at that time that he really couldn't get a practice going. His mother named him after the poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge, after all, there's not many other ways you get the name Coleridge. There was some book cooking involved with the young Taylor's parentage, because his mother felt that if he was already going to be at a disadvantage in life due to his skin color, he might as well not have the disadvantage of being branded a bastard. And so the birth records show that his parents were married, as well as several discrepancies involving his mother's last name. And however it happened, they eventually were able to escape the slums into the suburbs. Taylor's grandfather and uncle were musicians. His three half-siblings took music lessons, and Taylor himself received lessons from local orchestral musicians and choir directors. His life became characterized by those who would help him because they recognized his immense talent, and those who would show him the darkest sides of their racist beliefs. He knew that he was going to face an uphill battle due to his skin color, reinforced by his time in primary school, where he was called Coley, and his hair was set on fire. But he persevered and eventually won a scholarship to enter the Royal College of Music to study violin and composition. His composition teacher was Charles Villiers Stanford, who was by all accounts someone who would vociferously defend his pupil if he overheard any racially charged insults. All in all, though, he didn't face nearly as much racism as one might expect, as composers from Edward Elgar to Arthur Sullivan to Havergal Bryan all expressed interest in Taylor's music and did their best to try to promote it in any way that they could. In fact, Elgar was able to secure Taylor a commission from the Three Choirs Festival, which arguably jump-started his career. He was a competent clarinetist, and it was an early clarinet quintet that he wrote because his teacher Stanford said that there was no way you could write a clarinet quintet without having been influenced by the clarinet quintet of Johannes Brahms. And, well, Taylor took this as a challenge, and just wrote his own. By the time he was 21, he had several staunch advocates for his work, and he was beginning to get his name really far out there. And in 23, he wrote what would become one of his most famous pieces, the Cantata Hiawatha's Wedding Feast. The Longfellow poem had never before been set, and it was seen as novel and thoroughly enjoyable, because a lot of cantatas at that time were all drowsy and dreary, and Hiawatha was just all tuneful and melodic and light. He actually produced two sequels to it, but the two sequels never got the same sort of fame that the first one did. They were considered sort of like cheap knockoffs. You know, like, like most sequels. He married Jesse Walmsley, a former fellow student at the Royal College of Music, in 1899. He toured the United States thrice, with a high point coming in 1904 when he was greeted by Theodore Roosevelt at the White House. Although racism was still a big problem in America at the turn of the century, it wasn't nearly as big a problem as it was in Britain, and in fact, Taylor thought about moving to America full-time, though he never did. It was in 1910 that he received the moniker of the African Mahler after conducting in New York. It was given to him because the orchestra musicians saw his usually reserved style of conducting fall away to an energetic paroxysm when he was conducting Hiawatha. His fame was great enough and he was so well respected that only two white musicians refused to play under his baton when he was in New York. And obviously this is two more than should have been, but considering how many racists there were out there, it's actually pretty good. Taylor was most interested in African music and his own heritage, and he wanted to bring that into the fold of the Western tradition. What Brahms has done for the Hungarian folk music, Dvorak for the Bohemian, and Grieg for the Norwegian, I have tried to do, Taylor wrote in the preface to his 24 Negro Melodies. Despite this, the evidence of African music in his work is mild at best. In fact, he seemed most interested and mostly influenced by African-American spirituals of the United States. Dvorak, for his part, believed that there would be a great American music tradition that would arise out of these spiritual tunes. Dvorak may have seen Taylor's music as a step forward towards this imagined future. Taylor died quite suddenly at the age of 37, collapsing on a train station and dying just a few days later of pneumonia. It is often said to have been caused by his dire financial straits, 
because he did not receive any royalties from any of his most popular works, although he wasn't nearly as destitute as some people have claimed. Nevertheless, this situation led to a discussion in British musical circles about performing rights and royalties, and directly led to the formation of the British Performing Rights Society. His funeral cost seven times what he had made in the previous year, which doesn't really speak to destitution nearly as much to the sheer lavishness of this funeral. His death was caused by overwork. He held down several musical jobs and rarely, if ever, declined a commission. Although several of his works remained popular after his death, more were lost, including his only opera, Thelma, which was only relatively recently reconstructed and performed. The few works that remained popular were extremely popular, including you guessed it, Hiawatha's Wedding Feast. The precipitous drop-off in performances came after World War II, not so much from racism as for the fact that there weren't enough performing forces to perform Hiawatha during and immediately after the war, and its popularity just never came back up. After World War II, there simply weren't enough amateur and semi-professional choral societies left in Britain to properly perform Hiawatha enough to keep Taylor's name out there. Taylor was an ardent supporter of the Pan-African movement, and met many of the prominent activists of the day. He did not live long enough to fully realize what he had very clearly set out to do, but in his career he had done enough to prove his worth, and to prove the worth of his heritage, to anyone who would baselessly decry it.